hopefully you choose something for me it was drawing that you have joy and energy around doing that you want to do and that gives you a positive feedback in terms of the release of that creative energy this is synchronicity 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 Episode 54 of Synchronicity. My guest this week is John F. Simon Jr. Uh, John is an artist, a computer software artist, a visual artist, a drawer. And John is really, can I, 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 listen, I know I say on a lot of episodes that this is this is one of my favorite episodes. This is one of my favorite guests. I'm not going to say that this week. Uh, I'm going out there. I'm saying this is my favorite episode. This has been my favorite guest on Synchronicity. And I think you'll hear and understand why that's the case after you listen to the episode or probably while you're during the episode, you're going to figure out why. Um, John is incredible. I got introduced to John via Corey Allen, who hit me up, uh, I don't know, a couple weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago saying, hey, my friend John, um, has a book coming out. I think you might be interested in it. Um, I think you might be interested in having him on synchronicity. Um, and I was like, okay, yeah, let me check it out. Did a little research into who John was said, absolutely. Would love to have you on. We had a little pre-call where we got to know each other, just like a 10, 15 minute chat. And, uh, I got a really good feeling during that call, like an excellent feeling about who John was. Um, and then we said, okay, we'll talk in a week. Then he sent me his new book. And I, you know how like if you, if you're a listener of the podcast, you know, like a month or so ago, I said, I can't keep doing these book giveaways. They're costing me a pretty penny. I spent like over a thousand dollars this year sending out books. But for this book, John sent me a copy and it's incredible. Um, And so I am going to do another book giveaway and it's going to be John's new book. It just came out November 1st. So the release date of this podcast should be the third uh, or the second. So uh, I just spoke to John. The book just came out. A nice little synchronicity there. No, the name of the book. It is called Drawing Your Own Path. Uh, It is the cross 33 practices at the crossroads of art and mindfulness. Um, It's incredible. 
I can't tell you how much more is actually contained in the book. It's a drawing tome. It's a mindfulness tome. It's a meditation tome. It's so much more. Um, there, We talk about in this episode at some point kind of the essence of what attracts people to various pieces of art. And uh, I think you'll find in this book that John's kind of heart and soul is embedded into this book and it's a great way you know if again if you're a listener we have this book coming out from MindPod network um, talking about ways to stay present and aware without strict meditation sitting on the cushion some other ways to do that um john looks like beat us to it <laughs> he did really an amazing job um and it's draws on his own personal experiences as an artist, a very successful artist um, using software. He has permanent exhibits at the MoMA and the Guggenheim and all these amazing places. Um, But truthfully, just like outside of all that, he is someone who is curious about life, um, his own mind, the minds of others, um, and kind of the the emerge. What are we doing here, right? Like all of these questions that we ask ourselves, uh, sometimes regularly, sometimes not very often. He's asking himself, and I'll also say another reason I really love this uh, episode is I've personally been going through kind of what I refer to at the beginning of this episode as kind of a, a dark night of the professional soul. Um, I've been trying, well, my life, my life is going really great. Like truthfully in, in so many ways, I have an amazing child. I have an amazing wife, family, friends, um, going to an amazing house. There's a really a lot of excellent things going on in my life, but professionally, I've been trying to figure out what I want to do moving forward. I um, have a variety of skills, but I'm trying to figure out like, what am I going to do that's going to have an impact? What is going to reveal kind of the true essence of what I'm trying to do in the world? Then trying to figure out what does that even mean? <laughs> then taking it back far, what does the concept of me even mean? But truthfully, when it comes to the professional side of things, I'm kind of questioning what I'm doing, what's going on. I've put a lot of time and energy into MindPod Network, um, into this podcast. And while they're very valuable and helpful things and I get tremendous feedback, they're not exactly making a lot of money. And when you put a lot of energy into something and it's not paying the bills, uh, you know, you begin to question on uh, various aspects of what you're doing. Is this a good time? So this book found me literally the first day I was kind of going through this like professional existential crisis. This book found me um, and immediately was like a tonic for what was ailing me and the real message that I got at the time and opening it and going through the first practices that John has in the book um, was just it was calming and relaxing and allowed me to shift my perspective and focus in a way um, that you know allowed me to detach from kind of the stories that I was telling myself in my head and you know one of the things you know we talk about a lot of different things um, me and my guests about ways to kind of alleviate uncomfortable situations or various things that happened while we're living and living life, um, this is a real opportunity for me to practice those. And I'm lucky enough and fortunate enough, and I will use the term blessed enough that like I actually get this book delivered to my door the the, the time I needed it, like very the most, at least in the past few years. So really, like I could tell you so much more about who John is, some of the things we spoke about. Um, it, it, let me say this. If you're interested in creativity, in your own creativity, if you don't consider yourself a creative person, but you have some inkling that there's something there that needs to be expressed, this is an episode for you. I am listening back to this episode, I not because I'm egotistical, not even necessarily for anything that I have to say, but because John is just exuding wisdom and you'll see why based on his particular path and his journey and how he arrived to a lot of these things and they line up coincidentally or not, well, tell me what you think, with a lot of other traditions and philosophical viewpoints um, from around the world throughout time. So that's an interesting thing. We also talk about you know, how technology is a part of kind of this emerging consciousness and how, you know, John not only used technology 
in his art and his life and his livelihood, but use it as a way to kind of go back into himself, which is really, that's quite a nice little cosmic wink if you really think about it. So yeah, that's this episode. I, I, I I'm doing the book giveaway. If you don't know what that is, uh, every so often, really more frequent than I said it would be, I'm giving away a book uh, to the people who join the Synchronicity community. Um, so you'll join the Synchronicity community by going to syncpodcast.com. Uh, then there's a various places you can sign up. It's an email community. I also, this week, for those interested... I just started a Facebook community, a Synchronicity Facebook community. Um, You can find me on Facebook. You can find the community. It's a closed group, not because we're being exclusionary, but because we want uh, people who are really interested to be in there. We don't just want someone to come in there, start yelling and talking about stuff. So if you're interested in joining that, seek that out. I think it'll be cool. I'll probably put a link up on the website, syncpodcast.com for that. Um, Outside of that, guys, if you don't uh, win the book contest giveaway, pick up a copy of John's new book, not because I get money from that because John gets money, although I want him to get as much money in the world as one can get because I have a feeling he would know how to spend it, just an inkling, but uh, just because I think it's going to help you. This isn't a promotional thing for anyone. I just think that I can wholeheartedly endorse this book from about 70 pages in. You know, it's incredible. And I think it'll help you. And it gets in touch. That little Alan Watts clip I played at the beginning here. You know, I do think the best way to live life as much as you can when appropriate is in a playful state of mind. And this will kind of get you back in touch when you were a kid, like painting or drawing. Um, it can do that for you. So there's just get the book drawing your own path by john f simon jr i highly recommend it best truthfully best book i've cracked open probably in the past five years i'm not saying that lightly so yeah enjoy this episode um i don't have anything else to say thank you to everyone who has rated and reviewed if you like the show if you're into it if it's not terrible or you think it's not terrible, even if you think it's terrible, rate and review iTunes. I, I would really appreciate that. I like reading all of the wonderful reviews that people leave. Uh, it makes me feel good. Uh, if you want to donate, if you want to uh, have me question my uh, go through less existential professional crises, <laughs> go to syncpodcast.com slash donate or donation. Go to the website. You'll find how to do it. Uh, make a little donation. PayPal, you can use your credit card, whatever you like to do. Uh, I really appreciate that. Um, so enough about me. Without further ado, buckle up, strap in. I think you're going to love this episode. I don't think it. I know it. Here is John F. Simon Jr. Very good. I, uh, I'm incredibly happy to be having this conversation. Um, your book is incredible, by the way. I'm sure you have some. Thank you. <laughs> you must have some <laughs> inkling of just how profound and awesome it is. It's really, 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 really great. I get sent a lot of books for this show. I read a lot. Um, I study this stuff in a lot of different ways. Um, both from a creativity standpoint and kind of, uh, you know, interior consciousness exploring spiritual pathway. And this book is like directly at the crossroads uh, of those things. So it's really, truly like a real honor to be speaking to you today. Thank you. Thank um, you. Yeah, it's crossroads is even in the title. I know that. <laughs> it, it's very appropriate. And I've thought about it, uh, you know, it being there. So I'm super stoked that Corey introduced us. And uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. So thank you. Oh, cool. How you doing? I'm um, great. I'm great. That's great. Fabulous. <laughs> Start the morning drawing. So it was a good day so uh, far. That's awesome. Um, so yeah, let's just get started. I I normally write down questions, not normally, but it's not uncommon for me to write down questions and have, you know, specific kind of things in mind, uh, you know, before doing one of these. But I specifically, every time I found myself wanting to write something down, um, I didn't because 
the experiences I was having reading this book and even that I have personally been going through, I don't know, for the past two weeks especially, but pro- you know, for much longer than that, um, all seemed much more poignant and relevant to this conversation than anything I was going to kind of like come up conceptual, come up with conceptually and want to discuss. I'm sure those things will naturally evolve from this conversation, but I did want to start with, so here's a very interesting, you know, we spoke about a week ago, um, you know, in preparation for this, um, we got to know each other a little bit, but what you didn't know it was going on. And this really culminated with the end of last week, um, really the day your book arrived here, um, is I've been going through kind of a professional dark night of the soul. I've mm. been trying to figure out how to move my various businesses um, forward in, a, in an authentic way that also allows me to pursue kind of my own passion and creativity. So I, it is not lost on me that a book uh, as meaningful as yours uh, came in preparation for a show called Synchronicity just as this was happening. Because this is, it's relatively, I'm the type of person who typically likes to know what I'm doing, why I'm doing it, what path I'm on, how I got there, the conditions that happened, whether that actually matches with reality, it's not always to say, but I typically like to have a plan. Um, and the day the book came, I was questioning quite a bit about my plan um, in a lot of different ways. So I wanted to start kind of there with your book and with you. Um, I definitely want to find out a lot more about you uh, personally, but I wanted to talk about what led you, and I know a lot of this is in the book, I'm about 70 pages in, but what led you to this crossroads, right? Where This crossroads between mindfulness and creativity. Yeah, so so um, it's interesting you talk about that professional dark night of the soul because there were many of those kind of reevaluating what what's going on and what's happening. And I went through one uh, in the late um, 1990s to try and find a way to transition uh, my professional art practice to be more commercial. Yes, and also to. Um, find a way because I was doing a lot of computer programming to make the computer itself be creative yes yes and so um, I I say it was like the wrong question but the right answer because I went on this whole intense analytical adventure of looking at genetic algorithms and artificial life and emergent behavior and self-organizing all the all the approaches that were then current in computer science for how to do creativity or how to get uh, something to be novel, how to discover novelty digitally. And I eventually I found the, all the limits to those. Mm. Uh, in other words, if I made rules uh, within which something should uh, improvise, it never left that set of rules. How do you get a <laughs> set of instructions to get outside itself? And yet at the same time, as an artist, I felt like I was doing that, like I was right. innovating. Right. So, so I turned also at the same time in a kind of parallel track to looking at my own creativity. And the way I did that was that I sat down uh, with a completely blank piece of paper, not knowing what was going to come out and not making any assumptions, and just to observe my hand moving and to kind of see if I could discern those little rules. Why, I w- why did I draw that line that way? And why did I draw this? And if those rules could be distilled, you know, then they could be programmed. Uh, and what I didn't realize at the time was that sort of uh, introspective work, whether it be drawing or just sitting, was kind of meditation. No, it was meditation. Yes, 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 yes. So it was in a certain way an accident that I got into it. <laughs> well, it's funny that this accident, I mean, I, these are these happy accidents that it, it turned into, which is the genesis, I imagine, of the book and your main practice now, which is this fusion of your primary creative impetus of, of creating and drawing, um, and it fused into your mindfulness practice. And I immediately, yeah. um, I, you know, I, 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 as an addendum, anyone listening to this, um, check out the podcast you did with Corey Allen on The Astral Hustle. I mean, I, truthfully, I tweeted this out easily my favorite podcast of the year. And we're in the, mm. the twilight of this year. It was incredible. And I bring it up because what started firing in my mind as I was listening to this conversation is how this applies to my creativity, which is primarily based in the sound world. I went to a music college. I've been profoundly interested in music. I 
my love, deep seated love of music was uh, born, not born, but revealed during an early psychedelic trip. And since then, it's been a constant journey into what that can do. Um, and I immediately thought, you know, reading this book, and I started doing a lot of the drawing practices, like the first few that oh, were in the, uh, amazing too, just incredibly liberating. All the things I, I imagine you imagined as you were writing the book, people doing, I can tell you it works. I mean, it absolutely works. It has the intended effect, um, especially for listeners of this show and for me, people who really have tried to experience kind of what you experienced through your practice, um, this no self-experience, this interconnectedness, these deep fundamental truths coming out. This book really, really does evoke all these things through something. Let me tell you this. I think we broke, spoke about it briefly, but you know, we have a book coming out of my podcast network and this network, this consciousness network that is called Practically Mindful. And it is specifically exercises from 35 contributors, you know, big leaders in their respective fields, many Buddhist teachers, Hindu teachers, um, consciousness teachers, mindfulness teachers. And it's specifically about what are some ways to stay mindful and aware without quote unquote meditating. And that means sitting down on the cushion and closing your eyes or opening your eyes or doing shamatha or doing vipassana. Not to say there's anything wrong with those. So in fact, we're saying there's right, specifically right. not. But what are some other ways that we can tap into the essence of what those practices are at? Insight meditation, um, meta meditation. What are the, the essence of this? How do we get these from some different angles? So lo and behold, I get connected to you. <laughs> And here comes this magical book in front of my face saying, well, look at this 33 practices that are literally talking about specifically what we're coming out with. I mean, to me, this is the one of the most poignant synchronicities of, of my my life in this show, of course. Mm -hmm. So um, it's it's incredibly. So, OK, let's let's go back a little bit because I want to find out more about you as a person. I'm just genuinely excited and interested. How did you get in? The book starts with you kind of go it really starts to go where you're in italy and you're talking about how you're an artist but what what got you into art in the first place how did this become mm. a passion of yours yeah it's it's always been you know that's what's always driven me is like this um kind of deep-seated upwelling of energy that mm. wants to get out <laughs> wants to express itself in some way and it was directed into science early on because uh, my family you know I grew up in Louisiana and we're very practical and you couldn't make a living as an artist and mm. you could make a living as a scientist of course in the late 1960s NASA and the space program and engineering were all hailed so I so I and I tried to go through that path, but I but it was even more overwhelming. That energy wanted to get out and be creative. And then when I discovered that I could actually make a career somehow out of doing creative work, I just went fully that way. And I also felt like early in my um, teen years, there was a lot of frustration. Of course, that's probably a lot because I was a teenager. But <laughs> the thing the thing that uh, relieved that was um, made little um, Super 8 films. And uh, and then I discovered drawing eventually. So it was it always it was was always there. I would mm -hmm. say that, and not and I'm not the kind of person. There are some people I meet uh, that I envy <laughs> that can sit down and knock out a rendering, you know, mm -hmm. and just draw like beautifully. Like I'm not that kind of person. And it was so frustrating. It's mm -hmm. so frustrating that I that I had the admiration for that, and yet it wasn't a natural talent. And I took drawing classes, and I tried to learn that. And also part of what I try to say in the book is that the drawing part, the, the energetic release that comes from creative expression is outside of any social, personal judgment about the value yes. of what you're making or the, the, the reality of what it, you know, if it doesn't look like something, it's okay because it's this process of being able to express yourself that we're trying to get to. Yeah. And, and <laughs> you're talking about that practical thing. And the, the thing is on one side we have this desire and the other side we have this deep experience with flow. You know, that we've all been in a situation where we're playing a sport or we're listening music or we're doing something and we connect. 
and 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 so on the two sides one we're trying to get there and one we're trying to just be back in that state and so at some point they do they do match up yes and i mean this is this is called a lot of different things in a lot of different schools of thought right carl jung would probably refer to this balancing as individuation maslow would exactly. call this self-actualization uh, ramana maharshi would probably call this enlightenment or self-effulgence um but this is something taoism would call it the tao and being in tune with the tao um, and there are these oscillations, which you're talking about, where we as beings would like to remain in this purely whatever state that is, whether it's brought on by psychedelics, meditation, creativity, whatever. We would exactly. love to just hang out there forever, but we don't. And that is a function of being a human being. It is a natural byproduct of it. It's something that everyone from Buddha to Jesus, everyone has pointed out. This is a condition. Um, so the question then becomes, knowing that, Having experienced it, have, assuming that you experience some taste of what that flow state is and you've been there. And I, I truly believe that almost every single person has experienced it, whether they recognize that or not, um, because I do believe that's actually our natural state. That's the funny thing. I think mm. what we're doing through these practices and these meditations um, is we're slowly uncovering what is actually there. And the way this is described in a lot of traditions, you even specifically bring up in the early chapters of the book, it's akin to polishing a mirror. And then mm -hmm. you are seeing the true reflection of what is actually happening. Um, so could you, could you talk a little bit specifically about that practice, that mirror practice and how you came to kind of this uh, understanding or knowledge of what, what that is? Um, yeah, I could talk about a project I did called Every Icon, yes, which is a yes. software artwork. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and I, I at that point I was still on the analytical side, believing that computers uh, would do everything. And of course, in the early '90s, that was I mean, the, the hopes for computers. This is even before dot com really got going. Yeah. The hopes for computers and the economy and everything were going to be it was going to solve all problems. Uh, and so, uh, and I sort sort of believed that I could take on the art world and bring a new uh, perspective to art by using a computer to uh, l allow me to discover images, as opposed to pre-visualizing and having to be that person that rendered well. I could use a computer and I could generate the pictures and then choose amongst all the pictures. And so, so I wrote a program that took the uh, as the start the uh, Macintosh desktop icon of the original Mac, which was a 32 by 32 grid that was all black and white, and within that was the folder icon and the modem icon and the trash can and all our f familiar Apple uh, icons, and it starts with a blank screen, and it just starts filling in the squares at the top, you know, one, one and two, two, one, two, three, and it counts them all up. And it shows all the variations. And if you think about it, the, if you just keep showing all the ways of arranging the squares, all the icons will appear. And then it would just be for me to have this huge catalog of computed icons that I could choose, all the best ones. And that would be a kind of a whole, whole other way to use technology to do art. So I wrote it and I started it. And, uh, I, and then after the next morning, it hadn't gotten very far. And then I did some more math. And I figured out to finish the first line of the 32 squares would take about three months. <laughs> and to finish the first two lines was going to take about 500 million yeah. years. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh... So, 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 you know, te technology in and of itself and by itself was not going to reveal. It was going to take something more. And that... That's the that's the glimpse of the mirror there. That more. What's that? What's that choice? That who's making that choice? Yes. Who's who's deciding amongst that vastness? Who's making a decision every day about everything that you do? So and that points you inward. So what did you discover after you are forced to look? At, and I love that this has come out of you using because this is this is constantly. I mean, I can tell you now, being steeped in the mindfulness community and a lot of these communities that do this, you know, people are doing digital blackouts. They're doing digital retreats. Um, technology is is viewed in a lot of circle as a hindrance to a lot of people achieving um, whatever we're talking about right now. Um, my inherent view of technology is not unlike almost everything else, is that I do view it ultimately as a neutral medium. It's the intention and what we put onto it yeah. that gives it its value, um, much in the same way that money money does. Like I remember growing up, and 
for much of my life, up until really my mid 20s, I had an operating system running in my brain that said money is the root of all evil. Uh, you don't want money. Money, look what it does to the world. Look what it does to people. Look what it does to resources. Look what it does to communities and families. And that was really truthfully, at this, my understanding of money now is that's a false premise. It's an energy that can be used like anything. Tremendous positive forces can be used with it. So I bring this up because you use technology not only in your creativity to create works of art that were featured prominently in many awesome places, but it ultimately ironically or not, led you inward. So <laughs> yeah. what, you know, and that's what I love that. I was super, I love, I love that more than you could possibly know. So what did you discover as you started to go inward? One thing I discovered um, in writing a lot of software was that software wasn't a, a kind of an objective technical solution that in fact, one could look at uh, the software writing as a kind of creative writing and one could compare uh, pieces of software the way one compares literature. Someone likes uh, object-oriented, and they and and how you uh, codify things. And in my case, trying to codify consciousness, <laughs> the choices you make and how to limit that tell a lot about you. <laughs> and so what I realized was that you couldn't write a piece of software or really do anything without identifying yourself, without mm. exposing something about who you were. So it began to help me see the stories I was telling about myself and the assumptions that I made. So it began to reveal to me by looking at what I was writing and then eventually what I was drawing. So what did it reveal? I want to keep tracing this back. Sure. No pun intended. Uh, uh, what did it start to reveal to you about yourself? And did that start to inform your view of the world and the external reality? Sure. Yeah. So there was a, there was a human being, male, living in New York who had had a certain education, who uh, had certain ambition who had a desire to make grandiose and heroic uh, works that uh, that uh, changed the way people thought about certain things. Of course, it changed the way I thought about certain things. <laughs> so, I mean, to take on the idea that you would um, that you would encode con uh, consciousness or that you would encode creativity was a pretty a pretty bold move, and that it wasn't. It was all the negative <laughs> negative space of the things that it wasn't. It wasn't. Uh, necessarily compassionate. It wasn't necessarily self-aware of the downside of technology. Mm -hmm. So all those things sort of churned up in the meantime mm -hmm. going on. Like you're saying, you, you see the uh, negative and the positive side of technology. It's kind of a neutral thing. Again, it's how you use it. So uh, I was ambitiously trying to uh, make a living and make a reputation in the New York City art world, which I was doing in certain ways. And I was also at that time interacting with uh, uh, that. That was probably by '99 or 2000. The dot com uh, boom was going on, and there was a lot of money from uh, technology firms and the internet coming in. So there was a lot of attention for that, and uh, I was very, very egotistical about getting attention and sure. and getting things written and getting things out there. And so, and then at some point, uh, that all came into question. Maybe in the mid early 2000s, 2003, 2004. That, that that was revealed to me that that was that was the what what, what I was trying to do. Yes. So yeah, it's a it's a but and I found it also in the in the line that you draw. It's the same in the line that you draw on a piece of paper, which I discuss in the book. Is that it's as much a self portrait. If you sit down and improvise on a piece of paper and just let your hand go, that's the that's the line that you made. That's the that's the first most basic story. That's the software you made. That's the coffee you made. That's yes. the clothes you chose to put on. <laughs> Isn't that it's all telling the story. That's exactly right. And this narrative, I mean, there's so many ways to go with this. I mean, what you were doing is what Joseph Campbell refers to as right, the monomyth, the hero's journey. You're internally going in and enacting this myth. A lot of people look at the hero's journey and we see it externally in movies and literature and all this stuff. And it's, you know, it's it's not a caricature, but it's it's explicit. It's gross. It's right there. But what really the hero's journey is about and why it pops up in all mythologies around the world independent of each other is this is an internal voyage that we have to make and it is made throughout the course of our life and we can ignore it and we can ignore it for a lot of reasons. We can ignore it because we are too afraid. We can ignore it because of cultural conditioning. There's a whole lot of reasons. But if you ignore it, that thing you referred to when you were younger, being there and needing to come out, 
that's in everyone. There's not a person alive who that doesn't exist in. And the privilege of a lifetime, this is a Joseph Campbell quote, it, no, this is a Carl Jung quote, the privilege of a lifetime is becoming who you are. And this is this constant journey. And I love, love, love that you have integrated it. I literally get chills talking about it, have integrated it into your creativity and holistically into your life. Um, and I want to point out when we talk about this, because this is an important distinction to make. When we look at a book like yours, or we look at the teachings of the Buddha, or we look at uh, some really great wisdom from any tradition this isn't, re listen, the goal could be enlightenment, but we're still people. This isn't going to solve all of your problems. This isn't going to make you a genius painter. It isn't going to make you a genius musician, but it's a practice that can reveal things about yourself, which can help you accomplish what is eventually needing to come out of you. And I think that's an important thing to point out with all this stuff, because we live in a culture that wants to say, well, here are all the answers. You're never going to be anxious again. You're never going to have to experience suffering again. And that's just not how the world works. We, we talk about and we discuss and put these things out there to have people engage and look at these things as potential tools for their own transformation or polishing the mirror, however you want to put it. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, I feel like when you say about the solving your problems, that's a common uh, uh, conflation or misconception about uh, what's actually happening. It, it it may be that if you meditate, you'll be a, you'll be calmer to deal with things, but that's not. <laughs> it's a byproduct, right? It's, it's not a byproduct. <laughs> yeah, and so with with what I call within the plane of existence, within the plane of our everyday dealings. The way to look at mindfulness is an orthogonal axis. It's mm. like the third dimension coming off of that plane. Mm. And the practice puts you a little bit further along that axis, allows you to move along that axis and gives you a perspective on what's going on. So you can see your life. You can see the day-to-day. -day. And, and I discovered that in seeing, looking at what, how I was doing my own drawing and seeing my drawing. But then I can see how I'm treating my children and how yes. I'm working with some person. And that's the tool of mindfulness that yes. added so much to the drawing because I was able to see who it was that was drawing. I was able to see who it was that was driving the car or however you want to, wherever. It. And so it's so it's a so it's a kind of other demand. So yeah, it might help you in the plane, but really what it helps you to do is that third is is pull off of the plane into that new axis, that axis of mindfulness. And and that is why so many different traditions or philosophies or teachers talk about this practice of being an observer to what's going on. And this is something that my first experience with an observer consciousness, well, first conscious experience of the observer consciousness was uh, on mushrooms. I had taken psilocybin up at college in, in Boston. And I remember very clearly hearing two trains of thought going on. One mm -hmm. me saying blah, 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 blah. And then another one being like, what's on this? What are you, what, who is making this sound? Where is this coming from? And then the next thing I did is I went and started playing some music. And what I was playing mm -hmm. when I was thinking about it was a little distorted and wasn't a clear replication of what was actually going on. But when I tuned out and just allowed it to happen, Mm, yeah, I never heard something so amazing before. I was like, this is incredible. I, I could hardly say it was me doing it at that point. And this is exactly. that flow state. So um, I would like to touch on also your practice of doing a drawing every day, I think holds some really important lessons in it as well. One of them is that by doing something consistently, you then create a baseline that you can reflect back on to gain insights. And then you can apply the practice of mindfulness in a way that really draws out things that you may be otherwise. I mean, I like to think I'm smart. I'm smart. I, I, I can say that. I can remember a lot of things in my head, but I'll tell you what, I forget way more <laughs> things than I can remember. <laughs> so having something you can reflect back on imprinted in physical reality actually does a lot too. So if you could talk a little bit about that, that'd be great. Yeah, you create you create a space uh, in the mind, and when the practice leads you to kind of that flow state, uh, that absorption, uh, you get to be in that awareness. I mean, the goal of lots of meditation, mantra practice, and many types of meditation, listening to your breath, is to quiet the selfing process and let the selfing process sort of settle down, relax, and as you said, when you're talking about playing the music, you, you, you become involved in the senses. You feel the pencil in your hand. You feel the resistance on the paper. You know, you, you, you get a rhythm in your shading, and you drop into that. So you get experience being in awareness without really having to try because hopefully you choose something. For me, it was drawing that you have joy and energy around doing that you want to do, and that gives you a positive feedback in terms of the release of that 
creative energy, which is how it worked for me. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to be in this state. I like to be in this state. I make as many drawings. I draw all the time if I can. And, and just for that alone, you know, people say, has meditation really helped? Well, just sitting for half an hour quietly, really, it's a pretty good thing, mm. no matter what, whether you have any, any uh, real meditation practice or not, just kind of a little bit of time out. So when you're drawing, you get that level, and then you get the feedback of the drawing, so you get practice with that. And you get engaged with your senses in your body in a way that oftentimes when we're working on computer screen, checking our Facebook and email, we're, we're all up in that frontal <laughs> part of the brain and yeah. all in, and we're all about who am I and what have yes. I done and how many likes and da, da 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 And it just gives you a chance to let that go. Yes. And also to face something that you're not necessarily good at once in a while because you seem to drop into all like only doing the things that give you the most reward. Go and right. try to sketch an apple or a cup or and I'm and I'm and I struggle. It's a real chore for me to render, and I love that. And I really try to make myself do that because I feel the beginner again. I'm back in the state of just wonderment and discovery. Yes. And, and uh, there, there are the different uh, techniques of rendering that I talk about, realistic drawing and yes. systematic drawing in the book. And so just, just simply looking at something really carefully and the objectness of it dropping away, like you're looking at a cup or a bottle and then all of a sudden it's all the little details and the shading and that puts you in a non-ordinary state. That's That's right. In a different place. And I think what we're discovering, I mean, through science as well, is that neurologically, when you get a map of the brain, when this is going on, when you see and experience meditators who have been doing it for a very long time, I I wouldn't be surprised if the same areas of the brain are lighting up when you're doing that, when you can shift your consciousness into, I mean, this is, this is again, I mean, I've been greatly helped by psychedelics in my life because they give you direct experiences seemingly out of nowhere that are hard to, you know, dismiss. <laughs> you can call it whatever you want, a hallucination <laughs> or something agree. else, but <laughs> there's something undeniable. going on. There. Yeah, it's undeniable. And that is something that I, I think you talk about like flattening your awareness when you're looking at something. That is a total flattening of a lot of different awarenesses uh, if you get into one of those states. And one of the practices you spoke about, which I found, I haven't done it yet, but, you know, I was thinking about it as I was doing it, which is not the same as doing it. I know that. <laughs> but... I was looking at two apples and you talk about notice how when you're sketching something, if, an, if something is in front of another object, how your brain goes to fill in that object. Mm-hmm. And that is something that since I even read that, as I've been looking around and scanning, this is why your book is, I can tell you this with the utmost confidence, your intention for this book at the deepest levels is baked into it. And it had absolutely, I mean, I am telling you, it comes out over and over again, because since just that little exercise, and I did some of the other ones too, but this one in particular, it snaps me in to the mindfulness. It snaps me in. There's another, my previous two guests before this have been a lucid dreaming expert and a, another one who's very much into dreams. And this is another example of something that can snap you into intention and mindfulness, which if you can string those moments together, you really start to see kind of how the world functions and your interpretation of the world. So I, I mean, there's so much in this book. It's, it's unbelievable. (laughs) (laughs) Terrific. Yeah. Yeah. You hit on some really, really good points. Uh, uh, just that daily work, just going back to the body, just take, just taking a minute or two of your day to just be mindful and just make a few marks. People say, like, isn't this just doodling? And I say, yeah, well, the difference between medita- sitting in a chair and sitting in a chair meditating is just where your mind is, where your attention is. <laughs> That's right. And the difference between doodling and mindfully drawing is just where your attention is. And if you're just watching it come out and, and being aware of your senses, yeah, that, that just for a few minutes. And people say, oh, I don't have time here or there. Uh, but I draw on the airplane or on the bus or waiting in a line. I have a little sketchbook. And uh, what you find is that the line you make when you're um, irritated or frustrated mm-hmm. or nervous are different than the lines that you make when you're sitting quietly in the studio. Yeah. And you remember those times and you get to reflect on those times because you have these marks. And I, I love that about the practice is that it, it's, it's the kind of mindful meditation, uh, insight meditation that goes on on a cushion plus like a recording of it, <laughs> a yes. little record of it. And so I, so I put them all out, you know, after a week, after a month, I put them all out on the table and I'm looking at this kind of whole array of drawings and I'm seeing this flow. I'm seeing, 
and uh, before you were talking about um, uh, uh, cy cycles, and that was the vi uh, the image that I had for a long time. And I look for images that become persistent over time. And uh, and um, because I'm improvisationally drawing, I don't really know what's going to come up. And so people say, "Why did you draw it that way?" Well, I don't know. It just came up. This is like just letting my hand do what it does. And but sometimes things come up over and over again. Like it's maybe it's Beans. the same gesture, or maybe the sub unconscious nonverbal mind is trying to get something out. And I see these, yeah, these memes that come out, these themes, and I, and those are the ones that I take and make into larger works. And for a long time, I had this cycle drawing, and I had this, and I had a complete explanation for how we move from mood to mood. And this is Carl Jung did a whole book on the mandala symbology. Yes. And this was the mandala, and it even had the sinuous, uh, snake-like, river-like line yes. in it. Completely, when I discovered that, I was oh, I'm onto these archetypes, and I had a real solid rational explanation for what was going on and then um, after about drawing them for about two years uh, I noticed that it was really the negative space the space mm -hmm. inside the cycle that was and the, the idea completely reversed itself the figure and grounds completely reversed themselves and so uh, yeah going it through the daily practice gives you this feedback and it builds and the symbology comes out and I think the unconscious mind or the nonverbal mind is shy yes. you know and the ego mind and the verbal mind and the rational mind, like they really like to have the say and because they have the voice and they have the reason and they want to say. And so it takes some time, maybe not even the first few times that you do the drawing practice for all those to calm down. And, for the, and, and it takes a really long time, I think, longer than I care to imagine. But it, it also happens all the time just to allow whatever, scribble. I mean, yes. it, you'd be afraid. When I sit down, you're afraid I'll make a scribble. It'll be a mess. I'll be embarrassed. I'll ra waste the paper. This is a waste of time. You have to get rid of all that. And then finally, out comes something that you didn't expect that's novel, that has some wisdom to it. And then you say, hmm, wow, so, where did that come from? That's, that's So now what you're talking about, I know is applicable to any creative anything, whether it's writing, because I have experienced that is literally against all odds and rationale. The reason I continue to make music to this day, because when I graduated college, I have a music degree in something called music synthesis. Your guess is as good as mine of what that actually means. It means I played with synthesizers in college mm -hmm. and know how to write music and understand some things related to music theory. Does not necessarily leave you in the best position to start making money directly out of college <laughs> when all of your friends are going into law or whatever business. So I quickly had to reconcile and kind of say, okay, I, I need to make some money. I need to actually be doing this. I'm not going to pursue this creative path. That said, I continue to make music to this day, but what is happening in my life, those experiences you're talking about when something novel comes out and you recognize it as something either as a deeper part of yourself or something connected to the deeper collective unconscious, those are the experiences that really push you in a direction. And it's this bumping up um, of that against your consensus ego reality of this is who I am, this is what I do, this is how the world works. That is the, we all face this in every aspect of your life. It may not be with making music. Yeah. It may be getting into a relationship. It could be any number of things. But this is the balance and these uh, seemingly opposing yeah, yeah. forces where this stuff do, comes. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, how do you learn to trust your intuition? That's how do right. you learn to trust that, that guidance, whatever you want to call it? And how do you balance that against the need to survive and the and the rational mind that wants to, you know, be yeah. in control? Yeah, this is living. This is why it works so well. This is <laughs> this is this is that that balance. And and that's where my if you can pull out and be mindful and look at that, yeah, you don't get you don't get fear either way. Fear that's comes right. up often when you let go. But you you can use the, the muscle of mindfulness. And of course, I I had the drawing practice for a long time. But when I finally got uh, in with the Vincent Emily Horn at the, the Buddhist Geeks and started to take some lessons and do retreats and get more into the meditation, uh, trying trying desperately to rationally convince them that drawing was meditation and having them agree and still say, yes, but there are other tools. There are other mm -hmm. tools out there that you can use. And the, t the tool of noting and, and insight meditation can uh, give you a way of of handling all that fluctuation and kind of balance, kind of stabilizing it, and that's and that's yes. so that improved even my drawing, improved my whole life. But it even improved the way I was doing drawings, and you can see the reflection of that in the drawings because the the memes completely shifted after that. Well, it's funny because I'm scanning the book and I see this evolution that takes place through the drawings, and and what 
you're at, you're talking about here is I, I also saw this in a later chapter. I'm not there yet, but this concept of maps, right? This yeah. is it is there. Rare are the Ramana Maharshis who can pretend they're dead and ask, "Who am I?" for a day and become and get it right. People like me, I need to see someone else out there at least having mentioned what the fuck is going on. So I'm not like, yeah. am I like Carl Jung? Like, is one of my favorite people who did this because in the Red Book with Philemon, he is yeah. talking to himself in his head for years, questioning p- personally whether he is going insane while analyzing dreams and becoming one of the most foremost psychologists in the world. That is tough stuff to have to do. I've been forced into those situations where I've had to internally reconcile for long periods of time what is going on in my own psyche without really getting a break. And I think I wouldn't, as difficult as those experiences had been, I wouldn't give them up for anything because that is literally where so much of this is my being now has come from. Um, But these maps, right? So you've mentioned some of them. Others I have see you mention in the book, but what were some of the maps that you gravitated towards and who were some of the characters or figures that um, have helped you along the way kind of uh, mm. formulate your ideas and, yeah. Well, um, yeah, I looked, I looked for so many maps for so long. When I, when I started to, when the, when the drawing practice in, say, maybe 2006, 2007 started to open up, and so not knowing that I was meditating, I was still starting to have experiences, which now I see are signposts on the meditative path. And not knowing what they were, I began to feel like <laughs> Carl Jung and I was going insane. So yeah. I was reading a lot of Carl Jung. I was yeah. reading a lot of. He'll make you go insane. Of, he will literally yeah. make you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I and I and I was listening to. This is the beauty of the podcast world. I was listening to every podcast about consciousness and about creativity and about spirituality that was out there. Cool. And there was a time when you could pro- almost see all the podcasts, but not for long. Yeah. <laughs> and I was listening, listening to tons of podcasts. And there, and online, another amazing thing that goes on now is that you can have access to in a in a short download the most profound spiritual texts ever written in the world and history, and commentaries and and other people's talking about them. So I was going through a lot of material, you know, searching. I was on the search. Yes. And, uh, and so when I looked at uh, neuro linguistic programming, yes, was sure, sort of, sort of the first step off the path was maybe there's a way to work with uh, words and psychology and programming, because I knew programming, and I thought, mm. well, maybe I can work with it that way. Then, of course, a Western occult tradition, you know, and uh, words as ritual, and maybe you can, maybe that's what's going on. We can affect change. Again, psych- Western psychology, and then moving on toward uh, Taoism, Buddhism, Advaita Vedanta was a big oh, turning. Oh God, it's my that <laughs> was one of my. Did you ever listen to the Advaita Vedanta podcast that came out of Boston? Um, there was this is something I used to listen to like 15 years ago. Um, there's a podcast; it's still going on now, and I have no idea why I started listening to it. But I listen mm-hmm. to it every single night, and every night the rope and the snake, the rope and the snake, the rope and the yeah, snake, non-dual right. that's reality. Right. And it was <laughs> I would fall asleep listening to it, and it clearly seeped yeah. in. And and I'm sure and you recognize right, right. And I'm yeah, sure yeah. you recognize yeah. this: the wonderful parallels between Advaita Vedanta and Buddhism are just so wonderful. Yep. There's a unity there that brings these two disparate things seemingly together um you continue not to cut you off at all yeah well because you mentioned the rope and the snake there's a there's a parallel in the practice that i put forward when i talk about reading the drawings and uh and i ask people to look at their after they've improvised the drawing and they have no idea what's coming out and they really have no responsibility for what came out and it just came out you allow it to come out however then you make up a story about it. That's part of the practice. And so then <laughs> you see whether you're saying it's a rope or a snake. You see, you see what you're, what you think you see. It's almost like a Rorschach test. <laughs> I love it. So that's uh, that's all, all, all part of that. Yeah. So then, uh, yeah. So uh, Advaita Vedanta, and there was there's a podcast that comes out of Somerset, New Jersey, from the Arshaboda Ashram, uh, and the the teacher there. Uh, did a series of uh, lectures about Bhagavad Gita, and it was over the course of maybe three years, every chapter, the whole thing, and I did it in about six weeks or something, just like you say, listening to it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a map there, there's a formula there, and I got the idea that, yeah, maybe there is a methodology that we don't have the language for, and I started to see in some of the uh, practices, especially in India, 
uh, especially involving a Shakti practice, et cetera, which I'm not an expert on and I don't know a lot about them. But what I saw was that there is a deeper, richer vocabulary for creativity. Mm-hmm. And, they, and they were the ones that were for me. Now it's obvious everywhere because creation myth is in the Bible and everywhere. But I started to see how creativity and things coming into being, thoughts coming into being, the world coming into being were tied together. Mm. And so then, then the idea of programming consciousness and programming creativity, you know, all of a sudden took, took, took some real, uh, tread, you know, because here was sort of the start of a map. Uh, and then when I got more into the Buddhist, uh, ideas and the Buddhist practice, I saw the Mahasi Saidao tradition, which was called the progress of insight uh, path. And that, that was a good, I, I had seen earlier in the West uh, uh, writing about the tarot. Do you know the the? Of course, we think of course. Of, we think of it like the gypsy card. But if you look at the major arcana, the tarot, I, I have read and several books about the reading of that as a creative path. Oh, of course, and, yeah. And uh, and in fact, you can find a similar thing in the progress of insight path about how creativity and how thoughts arise and how they uh, pass through, and how they manifest themselves, and how they come to fruition. So there's a, there were, I started to see lots of these paths right. uh, come in. And the one I use in the book, which I really love, and I use it, uh, and especially because it's a visual path, is the 10 ox herding pictures, uh, which you see now out of Zen, but it also goes all the way back to China. Uh, and these were this was a teaching about the path to enlightenment, and it was illustrated. And... Uh, I really got it from the pictures. Looking at the pictures made more sense to me. And so in the book, I go through that beloved path and reinterpret it as a creative path and make my own pictures, which is also kind of a tradition <laughs> to, to redo it for yourself and tell the story yourself. Uh, that's uh, It's interesting. I'm sure you found, as I found in a lot of people who who get interested in this stuff and start seeking out and reading and listening and watching, how all of this stuff lines up in a very mysterious yet logical way. And it then my first, you know, the first couple of years of, of noticing that you're kind of in awe, like, Oh my God, there's this thing. It's like when (laughs) I heard of Jung's collective unconscious, wait, you're saying there's some place where we all, all symbols and archetypes and things come from. And we're just tapping into them with our limited consciousness and we don't really have an idea. It's like this huge concept that you didn't know was underpinning everything that's going on now exists and you see it and you're like, oh my God. Then I feel like the next natural natural progression is, is well, what does this mean? How does this mm-hmm. apply to me, the world at large? And then after that, you start to get to the fundamental truths of what these are talking about. Well, it's great that there's all this stuff there and it's this magical stuff and there's all these things you can do, but what's the point of it? And then I think what inevitably happens is you get to the point where you go, okay, what are they all talking about? They're all talking about clarity and wisdom, and they're all talking about compassion and generosity and real unconditional yeah. love. Um, so yeah. I'll share an experience. I, I've mentioned a few times on this show, and this was kind of a very poignant part of my life, But I took uh, LSD when I was 20. I had taken it many times before. Um, I took it when in my early 20s. And I had a very, I had a transcendental experience that lasted for about three to four months. And I was basically tripping um, in the truest sense of the word uh, for three to four months. Um, And everything, every single second of every single day of sleep and waking reality was one giant synchronicity. And I don't Mm. mean that in an abstract conceptual way. I mean, if I thought of a dog, I would look up and there'd be a dog. If I thought of Mm. a brand or a computer, I'd look up and there would be imprinted on the side of the bus. When I'd hit the street, the thing would turn to walk. It was like I was in tune with the world. What eventually ended up happening is, is after about two months of this, two and a half months of this, my ego started coming in and started saying, I am this, I am this, I am the God who is creating this entire world. Um, I am these elements. And in some ways, of course, I was correct, um, but I didn't, wasn't able to process what was going on. It was until many years later, and I had an inevitable crash from that state too. I went into the first depression of my life and really the only depression, lasting depression of my life. So it was easy to identify as an not a familiar state of mind. So I was able to get out of it through my family and friends and a lot of things. But 
One thing that came blasting through in that experience that I could not shut up about is this concept of unconditional love. And it wasn't this wishy-washy, yes, love everyone and love yourself, oh, everything will be great. It was this fundamental truth that was like was being imprinted or my brain was picking up and downloading as a signal. And it was so overwhelming, I think it blew out my internal kind of subtle body experience and I just didn't know how to handle it eventually came in a crash. So I bring this up in the context of when you start tapping into these concepts of wisdom and compassion, wisdom and love, heart and mind, then the next step is, okay, we see what these concepts are. We see that everything is connected. We see that all these things are pointed to the same thing. Then we get to the two truths, I believe, that underpin every single thing that we do. We want to alleviate our personal suffering so we're free of the world of cyclical clinging, attachment, and aversion. And then as part of that, we want to alleviate the suffering of every sentient being that could ever exist and will ever exist yeah. and have has ever existed. Now, how you do that is the beauty of this situation. You can yeah. manifest that in any possible way you want. Some people go into politics. Some people go into health. Some people go into charity work. Some people go around the world doing things. What I am particularly interested in, and it's my particular calling, and it seems like yours too, is this path of creativity as an act of liberating these preconceived notions that either we come with because of karmic stains or karmic imprints or are co culturally conditioned. Um, and I think it is, to me, the most liberating thing we can do because it's accessible at any single point in time. It doesn't require anything. So I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that essence of what this is we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you describe first the inward journey and then what I describe as the upside. Like once you sort of see those truths, once you sort of see into what those uh, teachings are all pointing to, uh, then it's back to that who you are, what you're going to do, how you're going to move through this world, how, with the dance you're going to do, and what you're going to create with every decision that you make, you know, and how you're going to make that contribution. So up, up to about 2007, 2008, yeah, it was, it was all about who am I? <laughs> And then I saw in my own moments of crisis um, that I had made this work and no one knew the story and no one knew what it was about. And so then I began in 2008 to put a drawing a day on my website on iCloud.com yes. and offer it to anyone who wanted art. It didn't have to be in a gallery. It didn't have to be, thanks to the internet, <laughs> in a geographic location. It could be for, for anyone. And I take email subscribers, and I have had for many years now, it's probably been eight over eight years, putting up drawings every day and writing, a little bit of writing when it comes out. Uh, and for some people, they write and they say, because they're doing, like you say, lawyers, doctors, accountants, and other, other ways of being in the world, they have, and they're not living in New York City, they're out somewhere where there's less uh, of an art community. That's their art moment. That's a, and I say that it's almost like a mindful moment in that way. I try to make it that. Mm. So, uh, and, and having put that out for a while, it's led to, to all this opening, yes. all this being here and, and putting the book out and sharing with more and more people that, uh, uh, so it's, so it's, it's grown on its own as I, as I've just tried to allow it. But I, so yeah, so putting it out there is part of the, is really part of the deal and finding a way to, you know, oh, oh, and I, and it's free completely, you know, like that. Yes, yes, yes. Well, you're, just, you're, you're not a sophist of old. You're not charging people for wisdom <laughs> in that sense. I, I, I want to touch on this too, because I have noticed a very interesting thing in my life over the past year. So this is this will be episode 54 or 55 of the podcast, and I do one once a week. So it's been a year. And this is the, the first creative project that I've done that I've put out regularly without fail every single week consistently. And, and, and I've noticed something, and I include my music on the intros and the outros, and I've gotten tremendous feedback that has really propelled me forward in a lot of ways creatively. But I noticed this act of putting things out in the world, and you speak about this too. I think it was on Corey's podcast. You speak about when you put things out into the world, that changes the relationship from it just being an internal thought and an idea. And I, I thought this was very interesting. I was in the chapter of, I think it was conceptual art, and I forget the artist, but you know, he said the idea, the idea was yeah. the important thing and the execution. Solo it. Yes, yes, exactly. Solo it. Um, so... Talk, I mean, this is something I've noticed too directly um, because I'm the type of person where I I probably have on my hard drives over the years 
a thousand, two thousand songs in various forms of completion that are completely not out in the world in any capacity. But when I do put stuff out there, whether it's writing, whether it's talking, whether it's this podcast, whether it's music, the relationship from internal in my mind there's something that changes this, this, the barrier between internal and yeah. external psyche and matter starts to dissolve. Yeah. And this very interesting thing that happens that transcends just the act of someone listening to it or reading it. Some yeah, other yeah. thing is going on there. It's like an alchemy yeah, yeah. of sorts. So, yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful. And I thought, think about that so much. And, uh, and, um, yeah, so it, it, it's on many different levels, too, because it's from, like you're saying, from your mind to the paper, mm. so you get the feedback, and then it's from you to another person, so that they get, and then it's you to the world now, yeah. even more, e and that change, and I, you know what I like to think about, it's, it's pseudo-scientific explanation, but it's kind of a good, <laughs> useful concept, I think about that Schrodinger's cat, you know, that's like, it's it's alive or it's dead, but it's not anything until you open the box. And so in your mind, it's in it's in this intermediate state. It's in this multi-dimensional, dynamic, multi-variable state that's going on, and it's cooking. And you think you see it, or you see it from different ways, and you have a bodily feeling about. But anyway, when you finally decide, okay, then you put it on the paper. You see, you open the box, <laughs> and then and then you really see if it's alive or dead. <laughs> you really see what it is. And, and, and it's also kind of, you, it persists in time where it's not, it's not the stuff of thought, you know, the waveform is collapsed. It's finally in this, it's, it's concrete. What, what do they yeah. say? It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's taking the trouble to actually exist, you know? And, <laughs> and, and when you, so when you put a, when you put a pencil mark on a piece of paper, you've changed that paper and you've not only have you changed it by the mark you put there, but you've eliminated every possible drawing that doesn't have that mark, mm. which is many, many more than the one you've just made. So you start like narrowing this thing down and you c collapse all the dimensions like the physical bodily feeling that can't be put onto the piece of paper. Mm. And so you start to do this dance with this thing. And then when you bring it to other people, uh, they're receiving it. And so they're unfolding it in themselves and they have their whole history and how their yes. day is going and how they think of you and so all of that those waveforms start to move and so there's a lot to lot to play with there <sighs> it's a very it's a very complicated thing it, but it's also a really beautiful thing uh, it's is very complicated and very beautiful and it's something that i always try to understand why i when i look at art i am not an art critic i'm not steeped in art art making visual art so I can approach it very open-minded and it's always fascinating to me how I used to go around the art galleries. We were living in the East Village for the past eight years before last year and there's all, all these art galleries started popping up mm, down yeah. the Lower East Side. It's nuts. Um, and it was always interesting to me. Don't know anything about the artist. There's no thing in my mind leading me to a certain thing and how I'd pass a certain piece and be like, oh my God, like yeah. this is just, and <laughs> that is what we're talking about. And those yeah. are the transmissions, the Shakti pot, if yeah. you will, of yeah. art and creativity that the intention and the soul and the transmission of what's going into the piece is that's yeah, yeah. what we're talking about. And that, that ineffable thing that exists, but nevertheless is there is how I can listen to a piece of music that maybe technically isn't as proficient as, you know, some amazing tech, like some a prince who's incredible at a technician, but someone that's really rough and raw and I can hear the transmission yeah. coming through it. Yeah. That to me is what's fascinating. And that, that is truthfully like what I'm interested in pursuing as my life's work, because what, Hey, what, what is that? And B, I mean, yeah, what is that? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know yeah, if there I is a B. Yeah. I talk about it. I talk about it in terms of resonance. You know, yes. you're you're at the right wavelength. You're resonating with that with that piece. And and if you're resonating with your own work and you put it out, that's the real reason to put it out because there is someone that's going to resonate with it and that's the work that they're looking for that they don't see in all the work that you see that's getting commercial attention or whatever. That there's a mo many to many kind of exchange that can that's go right. on. There's, and it's the person that's doing the work that doesn't fit into that, that people are really all of a sudden that becomes the edge. It's the mm. thing that works outside. So, so that should help people put away their fear to get their work out there because it may be that what you hear that you like, someone else all of a sudden hears and they resonate with it. And then you understand it. Yes. And I, so if you're talking, you remind me of a Hazrat Inayat Khan, a Sufi master quote, which is by one bell being rung, 
another bell will be rung and another bell and the resonance, the physical sound resonance is actually how this works. There's another image that comes to mind, which are the uh, iconographic Tibetan Buddha paintings where there's the Buddha at the top and then there's this flowing of Buddhas out to that cloud on the side and another one. And that is kind of how I think that's the psychedelic 60s leery uh, tuning. You know, you can start tuning people into this consciousness and then slowly they start turning on. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a it's a beautiful thing. I mean, this is this is where we're at at this point in time. And we, we can get into where time functions in this map. <laughs> but at this <laughs> point in historical time, um, I think we're at this point where this resonance it can be amplified in a lot of different ways. And I mean, you can look at this in a lot of a lot of different perspectives. And um, I'm generally um, a very optimistic person and have the the hope, highest of aspirations and hopes and beliefs that humanity and what we're talking about consciousness in general is a beautiful thing. But you can see the resonance in a negative way too. I mean, there I am still shocked. I am absolutely shocked that we're a few days away from the election here, a week away. And uh, we're realistically looking at, I don't know, whatever, 538 or whatever the polls are saying, a 25% chance that Donald Trump could be president. I don't think it's going to happen, but you see how this resonance can be used in a variety of different ways, aided by mass media and communication. And the reason I bring this up right now is not to pro provide a, a contrast or devil's advocate, but the way you evoke change and promote change is internally starting with yourself. That's why this book, I mean, I can tell you as a direct experience, it's, you know, it's just, this really is the biggest ringing endorsement I can give it to it. The book in the past three days, as I've been going through this dark professional night of the soul, has been such a beacon and guidepost for my own creativity, which is touching deeper levels of why these things are happening in my life um, to begin with. Not just the question of, oh, I've got a, a son now and a family and we're moving and a mortgage and I got to pay for things, but how do I actually do the things that are deep within myself that will help to evoke a positive change in the world and create something that allows... I mean, let's be honest here. I mean, you know, art is not a career for most people. It is something that is totally devalued in our culture, both financially and just value wise. We don't talk about, but you and I both know when we're talking about this, what's being transmitted through a piece of art, there's very few things that are as valuable as art in our lives and creativity. <laughs> These are actually the things that really like look at everything you love and care about in the world. Like look at your favorite story, your favorite piece of music, your favorite, like this is art. This is, this is really what exists. So, um, I, I truthfully, I'm just thrilled to have met you for Corey to introduce us. And I hope this is the first in many conversations that we can have because, uh, it's just been tremendous, you know, tuning in to what you're putting out. Uh, no, you, you've been amazing. It's been amazing <laughs> talking to you. You're an amazing, energetic thinker, which is rare. Your, your talent is rare. And I just want to try to find any way I can to help you express that and get it out. I think you're doing the podcast with such a good choice because it's such a good use of your talent. And I think that your music is waiting there. It's, it's, and don't think that because you're not making a top 40 record, your music isn't important, you know, like just getting the energy out That's through so the music and just like that'll be the workout in the gym. And then when you come to the podcast, you'll have that, you know, deep connection mm. to the flow and you're going to bring that into everything. So you I, know, it has a huge role in your life. You can tell that. I, I really appreciate it. And I, I'm, I'm so happy to hear you say that. So I want to end with, I do three quick questions and then one general one. Um, and then let's, uh, let's make a pledge to do another one of these and just stay in touch because this has truthfully been incredible and we'll be somewhat neighbors soon. We'll be yeah. along the Hudson. Um, okay. So here's the last questions. What is your favorite color? purple <laughs> that's good that's the <laughs> third eye the color of the third eye chakra right. is purple a, indigo a, a nice indigo um okay what is your favorite number um three probably cool it's a great one yeah uh what is your favorite animal i like the coral polyp oh what what is that that's the little the little energy in there that builds the coral reef, you know. Oh wow, that's so cool. That's, I'm never gonna get that ever again. That's awesome. <laughs> um, and then, so the last thing I ask every guest is, uh, what is a practical tip 
that has that you could share with listeners of this podcast that has helped you in your life. And I know that this comes with the caveat that you've just put together a book of yeah. 33 not, of these. So. It's not going to be a surprise. <laughs> no. uh, well, I, in general, I would say um, that thing that you love to do, do that, mm. you know, just get in touch with like what you really just, just like to be when you're a kid again and mm. you can just do that thing and just forget whatever it's worth or why you're whatever and go into that state because that's really and so for me it's being being there with the pencil like I was in kindergarten and just drawing and just loving the expression and seeing what comes out every day just seeing it seeing that flow however you get there 10 minutes like I say when you're dealing with the infinite you know even a little bit is enough yeah. okay so uh, <laughs> just I love that. a minute 30 seconds of just like letting yourself be that way for 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 the day and uh, and uh, I think it'll open up things uh, open up I guarantee it uh, John thank you so much for doing this this really really has been a very bright spot uh, in my week and day especially so thank you for coming on it's terrific Noah let's stay in touch yes definitely thank you so much okay alright bye bye what i'm talking about that's a good episode i know i say it often probably every week but uh john uh i've made a pledge to myself and to john we're staying in communication uh we're gonna be not too distant neighbors up there in new york soon um just a really special kind of incredible guy i uh so much uh respect and love to Corey Allen for introducing us. Um, Corey's a hell of a guy. He's got a new course. I don't, by the time you hear this, it may be closed, but maybe not. I think you should hit him up if it is to get in. He's got a course called Release Into Now, uh, which is a meditation course from Corey. I haven't taken it, but I know Corey. He's a really great dude. Um, I think you would enjoy it if that's something that you sound, sounds like you would be interested in. As a reminder, uh, definitely go and pick up a copy of Drawing Your Own Path. I highly recommend it for you, not for anyone else. I'm going to put it on my reading list on syncpodcast.com slash reading list. You will, it'll be there forever and live because it is incredible. Truthfully, um, I think you're going to love it. I know it, truthfully. Uh, So don't forget to vote if you're in the United States. Vote 
even if you're voting for Trump, even if you're voting for Gary Johnson for some reason, or Jill Stein, uh, or Hillary Clinton, whoever you're voting for, uh, remember to do that. It's your civic duty, and it's kind of like a cool thing that we do sometimes for, you know, whatever reasons. Uh, So that's it. Have a great day, a great week, and I will see you next week. All right. Bye-bye.